from WIS Politics in Madison. You're listening to Capital Chats. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a WIS Politics Capital Chats podcast brought to you by Spectrum. I'm Kate Morton, a reporter with WISPolitics.com, here with my colleague Adam, and we're here to talk about his recent interview with U.S. Rep. Mark Pocan. So, Adam, what did he have to say in your interview? Well, first off, Kate, hi. It is nice to be on this side of the microphone. Uh, and yeah, I talked with Congressman Mark Pocan. He is a Democrat of the town of Vermont in the Madison area. We talked primarily about the speaker's vote and kind of how that may be setting the tone for how Republicans are going to conduct their business during the 118th Congress. Uh, we also talked a little bit about his relations with some other Wisconsin members of the House. So let's just get into the interview. Hello, Congressman Pocan. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, coming on and, and uh, agreeing to participate in the interview. How are you doing today? I'm good, Adam. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Good to hear. All right. So uh, let's kick things off here. The big news in Congress this week has been the speaker vote. Actually, I guess last week, uh, but kind of still talking about it. Um, do you think that kind of sets the tone for how Republicans are going to work together uh, throughout this session. You know, you use the word work and together in the same sentence, and we're not doing that anymore for Republicans. So um, I, I think last week was the cluster that, um, you know, we didn't anticipate to happen, but, uh, you know, 15 votes to get a speaker, putting us at a 100 plus year uh, record of of what it's taken to have a speaker previously, watching the antics, the almost fist fight on the floor, the chaos that occurred throughout the week. Um, you know, clearly uh, Republicans uh, are are not exactly a, an organized political party up here. And, and of course, they had to go to daddy, Donald Trump, to to fix things at the end. So, you know, we're anticipating uh, this is is probably how the session is going to look when it comes to any kind of important issues. We have a farm bill to get done. We have to make sure we're uh, lifting the debt ceiling to actually pay the bills that we've already agreed to as a Congress. And I think uh, you're going to see uh, a lot of dysfunction unfold. And then, of course, lots of hearings on uh, things that um, are very popular on uh, Newsmax and Fox News, but maybe not at people's kitchen tables. But uh, we'll certainly keep uh, the far uh, extreme MAGA wing of the party very happy. Mm. Are there are there any like specific areas you can see Democrats like working across the aisle with at least a few of those Republicans or enough to get some bills passed? You know, the biggest issue is they set the agenda, right? They put the bills on the floor. We don't anymore. So where we did all these really giant bills last session, I mean, the most productive of any session I've been here uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to, um, you know, getting people back uh, out of COVID, get the country going, kids back into schools, get people into jobs, put money in people's pockets, to the infrastructure bill where, you know, we've talked about that for what, several presidents, and we finally got it done in the last session with Democrats. Uh, and even things like the CHIPS bill, making sure they were being more competitive and bringing more jobs back here. All really substantial, long-lasting impact pieces of legislation we did. I just don't think you're going to see that with this Congress because they're going to drive the agenda. And in general, the wing that's kind of the tail that's wagging the dog right now, that 20 people that, that kind of held out so often, they don't believe in policies as much as they believe in saying no to things. And that's the difference. So I think, you know, the difficulty they're going to have is getting anything across the finish line, um, we, we want to, I mean, we, we have to get a farm bill done, right? You have to do the budget process. But I think what was evident at, evident from last week is they're not going to come and get our votes. They have to get their most extreme elements of their caucus to support in order to do that. And uh, that means uh, we'll work closely with the Senate as they're doing things. We'll work closely with the White House where we can still get a lot done. But I don't think Kevin McCarthy is going to be coming to my office knocking and asking for anything real, real soon. All right. Um, do you think have you paid close attention to any of the negotiations for the, the House rules that, uh, you know, anything that Kevin McCarthy had to give up to gain some of those votes from the more extremist Republicans? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. He gave away a lot of his powers. Any one person can try to throw him out of it. You know, so if you're mad for whatever reason, you can get a committee assignment you want, whatever uh, you can potentially throw the speaker out. I'm not sure that's great for how the body functions. Um, they gutted the ethics, uh, you know, review that we have in Congress, which given, 
there are many unethical members, uh, you know, George Santos, if that's his name, um, you know, people like that. Uh, there's a whole lot of, of reasons why you want to have good congressional ethics, and they just gutted that in their rules package. Um, and then they uh, did a lot of little procedural things that will will probably um, make it easier for some of the more extreme elements, again, to try to be heard, but they're not mainstream values of how we get things done. So he kind of gave away the store in order to have um, a, a title on a new business card. Uh, I hope it's a really pretty one. All right. So um, kind of leading away from that speaker vote, uh, U.S. Rep no longer an elect now an official U.S. Representative Derek Van Orden. You had a conversation with him last week um, about, you know, the January 6th insurrection on the anniversary. Can you was there anything more to that that you two didn't talk about on Twitter? Um, well, I mean, I, I I did encourage him and I told him it was worth what he paid for it, which was nothing. But I encouraged him to, you know, he had a, a real opportunity last Friday to just completely denounce, um, as he did to me privately, uh, the January 6th insurrection. I, I guess he kind of backdoor said he regretted being there after he found out how it was played. I'm not sure if that's quite the same as just saying, look, a bunch of people breaking into the Capitol trying to overturn an election is wrong, period. Uh, that might have been a little more direct. I'll put that down to inexperience and naivete, perhaps. Um, but I'm hoping he realizes what I was trying to stress to him is you can't be both an insurrectionist and a member of Congress. You can't want to destroy democracy and also govern uh, the democracy. And, and that there still could be a disconnect. I, I think he was sincere when he told me uh, that he condemned it. But, you know, words are cheap if you're not willing to say them publicly to your constituents, to the people who live uh, in your state. So I'm hoping that as he continues, and he's only been in office for a week and swore and only since Friday, uh, he'll have more time to maybe learn how to do that and be really clear and, and really show that he's here to, to be serious about governing um, rather than, you know, having that, you know, Derek Van Orden slash insurrectionist after his name for the rest of his life. So do you think he's someone maybe you could work together with? I know he's obviously on the other side of the aisle. He's, you know, been on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, is he someone that you could see getting along or not necessarily getting along with, but working with in this session? We we agreed to get together and talk some more. And that's, I think, the most important part is I, I to tell you I know him would be, I think, a little unfair. I, I know um, of him and, you know, he's got a number of colorful parts of his background, you know, obviously like, you know, being on probation, the TSA for trying to carry a loaded gun on a plane and his fighting with a 17 year old library intern in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin over an LGBTQ book display. Um, and then he checked out all the books. I mean, some of those things I still put in the extreme category. So, um, but, you know, we'll, I, I'm willing to give him a chance. I just wish uh, he understands how serious the his actions were on January 6th um, because uh, the people who were here that day were lawbreakers. And, um, you know, I think the more clear he can be in that, the better it'll put him to be able to move forward and work with many members of Congress who right now consider him to be one of two insurrectionists that got elected this cycle. All right. Um, the other being George Santos, by the way, if that is his name. Uh, have you have you been able to talk with George Santos any at all? I he hasn't had a lot of people sitting next to him, even on his side of the aisle. I've got the feeling uh, he may be setting a record for his shortest tenure here. Yeah, I know uh, some journalists in D.C. have had a uh, hard time getting some answers out of him. Um, OK, so moving on, still kind of, I guess, sticking with the military here. Uh, there's been a proposal to cap funding uh, at 2022 levels for 2024 for the military that would essentially cut uh, about $75 billion from the defense budget. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, just how we talk about things, capping is cuts. And, you know, I think there's a whole debate we even have in the legislature, right, and all that. I have seen, they said they want to do a $75 billion cut. The woman who is in charge of the Defense Appropriations Committee under the Democrats, Betty McCollum, said that, gee, that happens to be about what we're giving Ukraine. I hope that that's not what they're going to try to do as a backdoor taking away funding from uh, our efforts in Ukraine. We don't know that, but that's her concern, and she's an expert in this area. But I also ho heard uh, Jim Jordan say he's going to get rid of some of the woke uh, parts of spending. Well, you know, we have defense contractors, we have military personnel, and there's not a lot of other places the money goes to. So if woke to him is childcare for our military personnel, I would consider that a cut 
to the the people who are serving us. And that's something I've always said, I don't want to cut. There's plenty, I think, when it comes to defense contractors, we could cut because uh, of the bloated amounts that they charge us, uh, the consolidation in those industries uh, that make it so we have no big contracts. We have, you know, we buy amphibious vehicles that only sink. Uh, you know, we've invested money. Um, the most recent uh aircraft carrier, the Ford class aircraft carrier has a problem that when the toilets get uh, clogged, you have to flush $400,000 worth of acids down there. Literally, you're flushing money down the toilet. Those are things that if we could agree on, I, I think would be great to cut. Um, but if he's, I, I don't think he considers that woke. I, I think what he's considering are things like child care for our military personnel. And I would uh, strongly oppose those sorts of efforts. All right. So is it fair to say uh, it depends on where the cuts are coming from? Well, right now, again, if they just freeze the budget, that's not a cut, right? Uh, I, I'm open to cut. I, I, I voted to cut 10%, right? I think there's plenty of bloatedness uh, within defense contractors we could do. The devil's in the details. And, you know, from their comments, if it's either going to be Ukraine or child care, I would say those are not areas I would be supportive of. I'm absolutely supportive of areas of waste, like amphibious vehicles that only sink and, and those efforts. All right. Got it. Um, so last question here. Uh, your brother, William Pocan, it looks like I've talked with Senators Baldwin and Johnson. They said they need to restart the whole vetting process and everything. What are your thoughts about this? Is this how you wanted it to end? Well, I mean, Ron Johnson has said no matter what, he's not going to change his mind, which is, of course, implying there's a mind to begin with. I'm not always sure with Ron Johnson, right? Um, look, you know, what he did was incredibly unfair. He uh, decided to use bail as an excuse because he was going to make it a campaign issue. Um, he submitted uh, four people's names along with Tammy Baldwin. One happened to be my brother's. Uh, and then the, the reason he said that he didn't go forward the night before the hearing um, you know, waited months to to, to say anything uh, was because of the Waukesha parade uh, case where the person drove into the parade, which my brother had nothing to do with. Once he realized that lie didn't uh, hold any water, the next day he said, oh, I found a case where he had $5,000 of bail. Well, that case involved someone who carjacked the prosecution came in and asked for 5000 The defense asked for 500 cash, I believe it was. My brother did exactly what prosecution wanted. The guy stayed in jail, never got out, and then my brother sentenced him to 20 years, which is, I think, the way it's supposed to work. So as long as Ron Johnson is going to be intellectually dishonest and, well, outwardly dishonest, uh, lying about, you know, he was just trying to use it for a campaign issue, I think it's going to be hard to move forward with any name because if Ron Johnson continues to be uh, irrational and opportunistic in these picks, it's going to be hard to get a name to move forward. So, you know, I would hope since the Democrats are in charge in the Senate and the president's there as they put a new list together, the minute Ron Johnson plays games, to shut him out of the process, because if he's not going to be serious about being a senator, then then let Tammy Baldwin continue to do the job of two senators. All right. Um, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's great to have you. And uh, yeah. Hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Adam. You too. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Well, Adam, thanks for sharing what Rep Pocan had to say, and stay tuned for next week's Capital Chats episode. Of course, Kate. And if our listeners want to see more, they can head over to our website at wispolitics.com. They can also sign up for our free weekly edition of DC Rap. That's where we write about the most important events going on in the nation's capital pretty much every week as long as Congress is in session. Uh, you can sign up for a free email newsletter of that on our website at wispolitics.com. But for now, I'm Adam Kelnhofer. I'm Kate Morton. Thanks for tuning in to Capital Chats, brought to you by Spectrum.